The revolution is real, it's live, and as some comrades say, it's lit, right? <laughs> Lit. Lit, lit, lit. The revolution is lit. Uhuru comrades, and welcome to today's Omali Taught Me Sunday Study featuring Chairman Omali Eshetela. My name is Akilia Anayi, Director of Agitation and Propaganda for the African People's Socialist Party, as well as your MC for this morning. Today's study comes from the book Reparations Now, an abbreviated report from the International Tribunal on Reparations for Black People in the U.S., edited by Chairman Omali Eshetela in 1983. You can access the study materials in the Facebook and YouTube descriptions. During this period, where reparations is being talked about all around the world, from the US Supreme Court to the European Parliament, we must analyze why that is. It's not because imperialist governments are growing more of a conscience in regards to the hundreds of years of slavery and genocide imposed on African people. The basis for which the U.S. government is entertaining the discussion of reparations to African people is due to the reparations work that took off in 1982 by the African People's Socialist Party, where we set out to make reparations a household word, where we fought to make reparations a demand coming from the streets versus a confined discussion in a courtroom similar to what we see happening today. We have to understand this in order to seize this opportunity, where a fracturing white power is desperate enough to talk about reparations. We have to claim this victory and continue to shape the narrative of what reparations to African people will look like. Our party has made reparations a household word and has forced it into the international discussion. We will learn part of this history today and will continue to learn more as this fight for reparations deepens. It is my honor now to introduce the man whose brilliant theory and unbending commitment to the struggle for reparations has brought us to this point, the one who set out to conduct 12 consecutive world tribunals on reparations, the one who made reparations real today, Chairman Amali Eshetela. Uhuru. 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 Uhuru, comrades. I want to talk today about reparations. It's uh, as a lot of folks say, it's an issue that's trending right now. Um, and subsequent to the June 19th uh, House uh, Judiciary Subcommittee uh, 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 dealing uh, with the question of reparations, um, uh, that was seen uh, by people throughout the country. And I imagine uh, many people around the world have seen it by now. And it certainly excited a lot of people. And that makes sense. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, and people have raised with us um, and with me uh, that they felt that the hearing was uh, totally incomplete. It wasn't what it could, be, could have been, should have been. Uh, 
because I was not there. They felt like uh, my presence uh, was something that would have made the difference in how that discussion occurred. I just want to say that it is highly unlikely that I would have ever been invited to participate, to participate in such a hearing as that did, which did occur, because I'm a revolutionary. And uh, we see reparations, the issue of reparations is a function of the revolution. And I wanted to say that uh, uh, whether I would have been able to be there or not, that would be crazy. Uh, it would either be uh, something uh, responding to a tremendous uh, lack of uh, history uh, and perhaps even mental illness to s assume that the United States government uh, uh, can and will uh, give reparations simply as a consequence of some kind of hearing that's happening in the Congress. It also should be said that, uh, that we are extremely happy that uh, this hearing did occur, because uh, it has been our objective for more than 40 years uh, to make reparations a household word, and there's no other organization uh, any place in history uh, in the world that has done more uh, to popularize the issue and question of reparations and to make it more than just an aspiration, but to actual actualize it and to have done so uh, for uh, such a long time as the African People's Socialist Party. Uh, for us, uh, as we say in our movement, the reparations uh, is not a spectator sport, uh, something that we engage in, that we actually work to implement. We are a revolutionary party. We are a, a, an organization of practical revolutionaries. But it was important that this, this hearing happen. Uh, and I want to say just a little more about that. Uh, here's the Wall Street Journal on June 20th of uh, the day after the, the day following the hearing in Congress. And it reads, uh, the headline is, a bill on, bill on reparations for slavery gets rare hill hearing. Uh, and it reads, a House Judiciary Subcommittee hearing on a bill addressing reparations for slavery, the first such hearing in more than a decade, signified the issue's newfound traction in mainstream democratic politics. The bill would establish a federal commission to study and report on the impact of slavery and the Jim Crow segregation laws that followed abolition. The commission would also suggest to Congress possible remedies for slavery's after effects on African uh, Americans up to now. Uh, while the bill which is known as H.R. 40 and was first introduced in, in 1989, is unlikely to advance in the Republican-controlled Senate. It has been unprecedented. It has seen unprecedented support from House Democrats, including a public endorsement by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who hadn't done so in her prior 16 years as House Democratic leader. The bill has more than 60 co-sponsors, all Democrats. That's an extreme. This is from the, the, the Wall Street Journal, uh, stating how they understand the significance of this hearing that just happened. And so uh, we think it's significant, too, but not for the same reasons that they have put forward. Uh, we have uh, been struggling for reparations, and the reason, one of the reasons they are having this discussion, as quiet as it's kept, is the work that's been done by the African People's Socialist Party for more than 40 years. And we can say this without hesitation, uh, without any fear of any meaningful kind of refutation. I want to uh, also say that we have no confidence and have never had any confidence in, in what the U.S. government will do. Uh, I heard uh, one prominent uh, African leader uh, on Facebook uh, a few days ago talking about, uh, very angrily, uh, about, I think, some of the people who are pushing and promoting reparation uh, Africans and or some, perhaps, who are not promoting, and he was very upset. And uh, he was talking about how the U.S. government has to give us land, and we have to have land. And, uh, and that makes sense. We need land. Obviously, we need land. We suggest in the African People's Social Party that we do have land, some 12 million square miles of it. It's called Africa. Uh, but uh, he was saying that we need, 
land and the government should give us land and should take care of us 20, 25 years. They've taken care of Israel for its existence, et cetera, et cetera. But, and, and I appreciate that. I think it was a very militant and powerful statement and it speaks to, uh, in some ways, what uh, actual uh, freedom and liberation should be about, except that uh, uh, liberation is not about being supported, uh, taken care of by the U.S. government. It, it means that we retrieve what's, what's owed to us and also, we have to say that we've had land. And I'm not just talking about Africa that was uh, stolen from all black people around the world, all Africans everywhere. Africa is still in the possession of white power uh, with other forces contending for control of Africa from white power, which is setting off a, a sort of struggle and conflagration of its own with the United States being in gov in involved even today in more than 100 military actions in more than 20 so-called African countries, even as we are having this discussion. Uh, but I'm talking about land that uh, of the indigenous, owned by the indigenous, or, or that, that is the, the land of the indigenous people that we occupy today on this, uh, on this uh, 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 under the authority of the U.S. colonial state. Uh, on January 1st, 1865, William, uh, General William T. Uh, uh, Tecumseh uh, Sherman, uh, who uh, is hated today uh, by perhaps Southern uh, white people more than any other human being with the possible exception of Martin Luther King, uh, he, and in uh, a declaration that was called Field Order 15, you've heard of the 40 acres uh, that was promised to African people, that actually happened. Uh, Sherman, uh, in, in, uh, in a field order, uh, uh, following uh, his victories and the, and the struggles against the South, uh, gave uh, to African people with uh, field order number 15 uh, uh, some 400,000 acres, some 400,000 acres of land that uh, went from Charleston, South Carolina to Jacksonville, Florida. 30 miles of uh, wide, uh, for stretching from the Atlantic coast. So you had some uh, 400 acres of land, 30 miles uh, wide, stretching from the Atlantic coast, and that included the, uh, how do they characterize it, of the, the, the sea islands off the coast of South Carolina and Georgia. And immediately when he said it, African people went to those areas and, and started settling in that area, and not only did he do that, but it was a declaration that said that the only African people could live there, no white people could live there. That would have some, been something that looked like self-determination. So Sherman did this in, on January 1st, 1865. Uh, uh, but by the fall of 1865, it was rescinded after Lincoln was assassinated and, and uh, Johnson, became, who was vice president, became president. He said, forget that. And uh, so we still are landless. And I want to remind people that even uh, the U.S. government uh, had said that African, with the Reconstruction, we were supposed to have some kind of equality and the ability uh, to be free in the South. And that was uh, by 1777. Uh, that had been rescinded uh, uh, by uh, a deal made uh, by the Democrats and Republicans. Uh, and, uh, the reign of terror was visited upon the African population uh, that saw the uh, birth of the Ku Klux Klan and all other, uh, actually, the worst possible kinds of violence uh, imposed on us, uh, convict leasings, imprisonment, uh, uh, actually terrorized many of us out of the South at that time. So the government, a, a bounty by the government, a grant by the government is meaningless. The, the United States government doesn't have the ability to be truthful in this dealing with anybody and certainly not with African people. Uh, and I just think it's really important for us to recognize that and we've always recognized that, that the power is in the people. And so that's why our approach has always been around the reparations question. While we wanted everybody to push for reparations, we are happy to see a uh, folk uh, 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 before the Congress, we we happy to see uh, Danny Glover uh, uh, not chasing Mel Gibson and uh, actually uh, talking about reparations. Uh, we're happy uh, to see uh, uh, someone uh, uh, Tanahisi uh, Coates uh, 
talking about reparations, uh, but the fact of the matter is that the issue of reparations is not going to be decided uh, in the halls of the U.S. Congress. We wanted to open it up. We think that it gave us an opportunity and gives us a great opportunity to, to hold this discussion. Uh, but the power is in the people, and African people are going to take reparations, and take reparations to the point, uh, at that point, where we understand that reparations are due to us. So I want to just uh, go into uh, how we've treated this question for a while. And uh, because reparations has been on our agenda since our creation as the African People's Socialist Party and even the Uhuru Movement even before that. And uh, we will be reading from Reparations Now. Uh, this is a book that we published in 1983. Uh, uh, we had uh, the first tribunal on reparations for African people, world tribunal on reparations for African people, uh, in, on November 1982, 1983, uh, this came out. This is a condensed uh, version of uh, testimony from some of the people who uh, testified. This is really important because we didn't go pleading to the U.S. government. We put the United States government on trial. The government on trial. The government that had promised uh, 40 acres that, of land that they stolen from the indigenous people, the African people, and then rescinded that. The government that had said with reconstruction African people were supposed to be free, and then uh, 11 years after that had begun a murderous reign of terror against black people that put us back on the plantations where all of the capitalists needed us to be in order to continue to feed the capitalist social system. The government that's responsible even up until recently, the murder of Mike Brown and Ferguson and that government that's reigning terror around the world uh, that, uh, and, and our oppression and exploitation being a part of that, that government, we, didn't, we went and put it on trial. We put the government on trial. And I think it's really important to say that and tell the people around the world and ask African people before a panel of judges to determine whether reparations were due to African people. So that's a different approach at all. We arm the people with an understanding. So the Wall Street Journal of, of, Ju of, July, of June 20th, the day following the hearing, uh, indicated that uh, uh, H.R. 40 was supposed to uh, be able to tell, uh, to, uh, to authorize a study uh, to determine whether African people should receive reparations. Well, I got to tell you this, and I hate to be the one to have to tell you this, but that study has been done. And that study uh, was done, and the, and the evidence from, of that study, the consequences of that study was taken before an uh, international panel of judges that African people ourselves empowered and held a hearing in, in, in Brooklyn, New York, uh, producing that study, a study that included uh, 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 the first uh, actual uh, a quantification of value that's stolen from black people in the form of labor alone uh, that's ever been done was done at that, at that tribunal. Uh, we had uh, testimony from historians, uh, from psychologists, uh, from a, an array of people, from people uh, like Afeni Shakur. And we'll say more about that. I just want to give you the fact that the, the power is in the people from our perspective. Our perspective has always been that reparations will be a function of revolution and it will occur at the point where African people ourselves demand it, not where a U.S. court or a U.S. governmental organization entity or the U.S. government itself uh, say that reparations are due. In fact, it will be the power of the people that will force the U.S. Congress, that will force the courts and what have you to say, hey, let's pay them off and hopefully try to quiet this thing, stop this movement from from growing, and our struggle has been to win masses of African people into this discussion. And there's a ton of work that over the next two or three uh, uh, sessions of this discussion, we'll expose about how reparations is not, again, a spectator sport, and how the African People's Socialist Party has engaged in the fight for reparations that included organizing the first tribunal, world tribunal reparations for African people. I want to send a shout out uh, to comrades uh, 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 Gaida Cambon, uh, who played a really important role uh, in building this tribunal in New York in 1982, uh, to comrade uh, Omawale K. Fing uh, out of Houston, Texas right now, who was there uh, in the trenches making this to comrades uh, Oronde uh, Takunda uh, in, in New York 
who at the time was a member of the African People's Socialist Party and uh, worked with us in uh, fighting tooth and nail against all of the recalcitrant black nationalists uh, in New York uh, to make this uh, reparations tribunal happen, uh, most of whom are now on board with the reparations demand. I want to thank uh, people like Rob Fogarty, a North American white woman who uh, was a part uh, of uh, uh, helping to build uh, reparations and winning other white people to this question, along with Penny Hess, along with uh, uh, Red Beard uh, out of California, and a host of other folk who uh, participated in making this uh, a reality and who even up to now continue to participate and building the reparations movement and actualizing reparations as opposed to uh, uh, waiting until the Congress does or does not do something. So I'm going to begin. We're going to work with two chapters. And I'm going to be expeditious, because I am going to leave some time for discussion, despite the fact that I've, I've used so much time in the form of what we might characterize as an overview. And the, uh, it will be an, I will read the introduction, and then I will read uh, from the Burning Spear newspaper, an article uh, that came out immediately after the, the uh, reparations uh, tribunal. Both of uh, these are in uh, the book, Reparations Now, and you should have in your possession uh, a part of this that we'll be reading from. And this is really important for members of the African People's Socialist Party in particular, because I know some of you have been upset uh, by watching uh, not, because, not simply watching it because of, uh, you know, we have opinions about uh, what was said and how it was said at the U.S. Congress, and we have some opinions about uh, the validity of uh, some of the forces who were saying these things. Uh, but it all uh, should serve the purpose of building the revolutionary movement and making revolution, making reparations reality, because in the final analysis, it's what we do in the trenches that's going to make the difference, not what happens in the Congress. We make, <clears throat> we make things happen in the Congress from the streets. We make things happen in the courts from the work that we do in these communities, and we've been doing a lot of work for 40 years around this question of reparations, and you can see the material evidence of the reparations movement. It's not an aspiration, it's a reality. <clears throat> so I'm going to start with the introduction. <clears throat> on November 13, 1982, a two-day World Tribunal on Reparations for black people in the U.S. was held in New York City. The full significance of that tribunal will ultimately be summed up in history by the process of black struggle which continues to unfold and which uh, will uh, itself be influenced by the tribunal. Such struggle as that which will be generated by the demand for reparations being generalized within the oppressed and colonized African community in the U.S. Such struggle as that which will be influenced by the development and leadership of the African National Reparations Organization, ANRO, founded on the two days immediately following the World Tribunal, and such struggle as that which will occur under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party, the advanced forces of the colonized African working class in the U.S. And ANRO, the African National Reparations Organization, is a mass organization that was created by the African People's Socialist Party, whose, or, whose, whose only struggle and pursuit was reparations, to take reparations out into the world, and that the organization that held uh, uh, 12 uh, uh, continuous reparations hearings, tribunals throughout the United States uh, in the part of the process of taking reparations to the people, not to the Congress, to the people. We didn't make a single effort to go to the Congress or to a court. We went straight to the people because we understood that's where the question really resides. However, while we must leave much to history's judgment as to the full significance of the World Tribunal, there are some things which we can say today such a short time after the occurrence of the World Tribunal. One thing the World Tribunal did was to establish a process with, uh, within uh, wherein the issue of reparations, uh, with, I'm sorry, one thing the World Tribunal did was to establish a process wherein the issue of the oppression of African people in the U.S. will have to be taken seriously again by the international community. This is 1982 that we're talking. It is hard to believe that within uh, the short period of 10 years, uh, the plight and just cause of the domestically colonized African community in the U.S. has receded from the active consciousness of the peoples in the world. Uh, it, it was, and this is an important statement because 
the, the black revolution of the 1960s that occurred in the United States sparked struggle not only in the United States. It was this movement uh, that took white women uh, out of the kitchen, white homosexuals out of the closet. It was this movement that unleashed uh, struggles of oppressed peoples around the world. In fact, much of the world looked to the struggle of African people in the United States as essential to the liberation of the peoples of the planet Earth. And this is what we're referring to. This, this is, we're talking about uh, in 1982. Uh, now, this struggle has receded from the consciousness and memory. And the people who watched that hearing uh, also have no memory of struggle prior to now, many of them. And so they see this thing, and they think they're seeing uh, history uh, being made, when actually what they're seeing is a reflection of the struggles of, of, the, of the history that forced them to have to have this discussion today. How is it that in 2019, uh, the United States government, a uh, sector of the Congress, a sector of the ruling, one of the ruling parties of this country is now, are now consumed with the question of reparations? What happened? Was it, was it uh, while we were sleeping, did Jesus return or some other uh, magic thing uh, come to them to say, hey, say reparations? Did some significant uh, uh, epiphany occur uh, that say, hey, let's say reparations, we, let's love black people today? I think not. It was not so long ago that the heroic cause of our people was recognized worldwide, that the courage of our militants and revolutionaries was world-renowned. Because of their pro prominent roles in providing leadership for our people against our most formidable enemy and oppressor Malcolm X, Dr. Martin Luther King, the leadership of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the Black Panther Party traveled the world with other great uh, international figures who sought the end of human oppression and the creation of just social systems. And I want to say that these were movements that we were engaged in that sought the end of human oppression and the creation of a just social system, not just a payday. And because you're not going to get a payday in an unjust system. The, these were the heady days of worldwide mobilization, the days of Che, Ho Chi Minh, Mao, and the uh, Cultural Revolution. These were the days of the Tupamaras, of, of Cabral, of Black Power and Black Panthers. Much has changed since that time. One of the most significant things to happen was the brutal suppression of our movement. Such vicious military suppression as that which events the murders of Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, Malcolm X, Fred Hampton, Mark Clark, and tens of members of the Black Panther Party, along uh, with those less influential organizations throughout the US. This suppression resulted in forced exile for many and frame-ups and imprisonment for many more. And, and I think of Sundiata Okoli and so many uh, other comrades who are rotting in prisons and, and uh, Asada Shakur running uh, from the shadows in Cuba today because she's been hunted like an animal uh, by, uh, by U.S. government and its forces and its lackeys who have actually gone to Cuba, who are renowned so-called black leaders, uh, uh, figures who've gone to Cuba uh, with the intent of being able to facilitate the capture of uh, Asada Shakur by the United States government. Today, it, would, it may be argued that more of our militants and revolutionaries languish behind prison bars than among us within the colonized African communities of the U.S. Geronimo Pratt, Suniato Coley, Herman Bell, Albert Washington, Deruba Moore, Anthony uh, Labor, James York, uh, Bernice Jones, et cetera, et cetera, are no longer on the streets of the U.S. Asada Shakur, free only because of a daring prison escape, is hunted like an animal throughout the U.S. by officers of the U.S. colonial state who surely intend to end her life as they have attempted to do in the past. This is Asada. This is the U.S. government that's tracking her down. The U.S. government that we're saying give us reparations that, and we can't even get them to stop hunting Asada down, to stop putting bounty on Asada. The state of New Jersey, there, there are senators from New Jersey and from the state of Florida who are now doing everything they can uh, to pressure the Cuban government to turn Asada Shakur over. They're going to give us reparations? Subsequent to this brutal attack on our movement, and its leaders, the U.S. government has worked diligently to convince the world community of its changed character as it relates to black people. 
a changed character which the U.S. government alleges has resulted in the Americanization of its African population, which has now achieved its basic aspirations. To do so was not as difficult as some might think. As a result of the terror and carnage strong throughout our oppressed, colonized communities, resulting in the imprisonment and murder of our leaders and the destruction of our militant organizations, our people were temporarily pacified. Their voices stilled, and the U.S. government and the international community were relieved of the terrible din caused by 40 million African people who were demanding bread, peace, and black power. And it is quiet, and if the quiet which now prevailed within our community was not enough to convince the peoples of the world that black people had become finally free and no longer needed to rise up in opposition to the U.S. government, several other ploys succeeded in quelling any suspicion. One ploy was dependent on the election of James Earl Carter as U.S. president in 1976. Carter's election was one which saw more than 90% of the black vote go to a plantation owner. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Carter's election was one which saw more than 90% of the black vote go to a plantation owner from the Deep South, which was the immediate origin of the black movement so recently crushed by the U.S. government. Was this not evidence of a reconciliation between the interests of the black population and the U.S. government? If not, Carter's selection of Andrew Young as U.S. ambassador to the United Nations surely served the purpose. Thus, the world community was misled as were our own nearly leaderless people. But no longer. The World Tribunal not only exposes to the international community that the oppression of African people is alive and well in the U.S., it also exposes the fact that our oppression has existed along one long continuum that there has never been any cessation in our oppression. There has never been any cessation in our oppression. This is one significance of the World Tribunal, but not the only one. Another significance of the World Tribunal was the process it initiated in summing up our history of oppression and struggle for African people ourselves who are the victims of our oppression. Now the victims of U.S. terror within and without its borders can be better armed in, in our attempt to overthrow this terror. This pamphlet represents only a tiny portion of the testimony and documentation presented at the World Tribunal on Reparations for Black People in the U.S. The entire Tribunal proceedings will be published in the immediate near future. However, even this inadequate representation of the World Tribunal should serve to alert the reader to the historical significance of the World Tribunal. The precedent provided by the Tribunal will have an impact on people's struggles for years to come. For the first time in its history, the U.S. government has been put on trial for its crimes against black people by black people ourselves. Moreover, the World Tribunal on Reparations for Black People in the U.S. established precedents in international law which has, has previously been treated as the sole property of those with the benefit of state power. We established precedents in international law which had previously uh, been, seen, been treated as the sole property of those with the benefit of state power. Finally, the World Tribunal took the concept of law and raised it as having significance for those other than the property classes. The Tribunal smashed the bourgeois concept of one justice for all peoples and classes and raised the truth that the justice of the oppressed will result in the destruction of the justice of the oppressor, a justice which legitimizes oppression. The World Tribunal occurred as an initiative of the African People's Socialist Party, an organization of black workers by ideology and, compos and actual composition. Therefore, we can correctly say that the World Tribunal was an initiative of the African working class itself. The fact that 94% of the African population in the U.S. belongs to the black working class, whose heroism has only been recently forgotten, will soon provide the most magnificent testimony 
uh, of the significance of the World Tribunal on reparations for black people in the U.S. throughout the streets of the United States of America whose very wealth and very existence has come at the expense of the life, property, and well-being of millions of African people. And this is one of the reasons why I could not be uh, even asked by the organizers of this thing that happened in the Congress to be there because it's the African working class speaking with his own voice about what reparations means. To, this is what we are talking about. So it's not an academic question, and it's not a spectator sport. And somebody who just discovered reparations because they read a book or two uh, uh, cannot uh, come down from their lofty uh, heights and then uh, provide the answers for us to uh, our enemies, uh, to the camp of the enemy as the primary or the only or the fundamental means by which the question of reparation had to be addressed. And so we've said all along, let's push it from all angles, but central to this question is the power of the African working class that has to be mobilized to fight, to take back what belongs to us because the U.S. Congress has proved over and over and over again that it cannot be trusted with the future of Africa or any other oppressed peoples around the world and that most of us, the African working class, certainly conscious of what our own interests are, would refuse even reparations if it meant that we would continue peacefully residing uh, in a country such as this that resides uh, on the land stolen from the indigenous people and is used as a base for the suppression of the rights uh, and resources of all the peoples on the planet Earth. So this is the burning spear from December 1982. So the tribunal held in, in November 1982. This is December 1982 uh, from the burning spear newspaper. The African people, the, 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 the headline uh, reads, U.S. found guilty of crimes against Africans in the U.S. Now, you won't get a guilty verdict from the U.S. Congress on the crimes committed against African people. You, they, you couldn't have got that for on, on Juneteenth, as it's called. Uh, uh, where we ha I won't even get into that. But on Juneteenth, the U.S. Congress was not going to give us a guilty verdict of the crimes of against Africans in the USA. So the people's uh, advocate read through the charges one by one and asked the panel of international judges for their verdict. A silence fell over the hall. Charge number one, is the United States, uh, States guilty of genocide against African people in the US as defined by the United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide? Guilty by unanimous vote. Charge number two, is the United States guilty of violation of the United Nations Charter as it relates to, its, to the U.S. treatment of Africans in the United States? Guilty by unanimous vote. Charge number three, is the United States guilty of violation of the spirit and intent of the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. Guilty by unanimous vote. Charge number four, is the United States guilty of violation of the spirit and intent of the International Bill of Human Rights? Guilty by, an unanim by unanimous vote. The audience, made up largely of African people, broke out in spontaneous and sustained applause, probably the first time a guilty verdict in a legal proceeding inside the U.S. had been greeted with joy by African people in the last 400 years. After being restored to order, the court proceeded with the judgment of the panel on punishment and or rectification. One, are African people in the U.S. do reparations from the U.S. government? This had been established in the course of the tribunal as $4.1 trillion in stolen labor alone with damages to be determined later. Yes, by unanimous vote. Two, should imprisoned black revolutionaries be granted national political prisoner and prisoner of war status based on the Geneva Convention and other United Nations determinations? Yes, by unanimous vote. Three. Does the United States government 
does the United States treatment of Africans in the U.S. <laughs> represent a serious enough breach of the United Nations Human Rights Charter to justify eviction of the U.S. from the United Nations? Yes, by unanimous vote. Four, does the testimony and documentation presented at the tribunal justify the establishment of a permanent international body to monitor U.S. treatment of African people in the U.S.? Yes, by unanimous vote. Again, applause swept the auditorium along with a feeling of satisfaction at the collective achievement that had been reasoned in providing, in proving beyond, that had been reached rather. Okay, again, applause swept the auditorium along with a, with a feeling of satisfaction at the collective achievement that had been reached in proving beyond a doubt the collective achievement that had been reached in proving beyond a, re, a beyond a doubt the just cause the just case of african people for reparations of anger at the endless tales of suffering and injustice that have been related in the past two days of testimony and of strong determination to make the judgment of the tribunal out to take the judgment of the tribunal out into the world to build a people's struggle that will make the conclusions recognized as law as the fair judgment of history and of the people of the world. This is what the tribunal did. I want to read that paragraph again. Again, applause swept the auditorium along with a feeling of satisfaction at the collective achievement that had been reached in proving beyond a doubt the just case of African people for reparations. So this is pre this is pre-HR 40, <laughs> that prove uh, without a doubt the just case of African people for reparations, of anger at the endless tales of suffering and injustice that had, had been related in the past two days of testimony and of strong determination to take the judgment of the tribunal out into the world to build a people's struggle that will make the conclusions recognized as law as the fair judgment of history and of people of the world. The International Tribunal on Reparations for Black People in the U.S. was a precedent-setting and mobilizing legal hearing, the first time in history that the U.S. government had been formally put on trial for crimes against black people in the U.S. This tribunal was conducted with the utmost seriousness, adhering to the rules of evidence to support the charges that the U.S. had violated international law. Many of these laws, such as the International Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crimes of Genocide, have never been ratified by the U.S. Senate, precisely because the U.S. government fears it will be brought before world court to answer for its treatment of African people and Native people in the U.S. The task of the hearings, then, has been to amass evidence while at the same time pressing for the U.S. to be called to accountability for its historic crimes and fighting for the right of African people who do not possess state power to have a hearing before international panels on human rights. This is the work that Malcolm X was just beginning to bring to fruition when he was assassinated to silence his leading voice. The tribunal had been in the, bu in the building stages for the past year. As the African People's Socialist Party established committees across the U.S. to build awareness of the upcoming tribunal, to gather thousands of reparations claims by individual Africans to present it at the tribunal. And what we mean here is that we had actually drawn up claims, reparations claims, documents that African people were signing all around the world and even got one from Michael Jackson. Uh, which was uh, extremely interesting because this is, this is taking it to the people, not to the Congress, but to the people. This is our approach. And while we wanted everything to be done to put reparations on, help get reparations on the agenda, our strategy was key. The, the key to our strategy, rather, was to make reparations a household word, to put it, the reparations demand, to make it the possession of the people. Because without that kind of thing having happened, there's no way in hell that the reparations issue would be before the U.S. Congress. It wouldn't, there was no way in hell that the Judiciary Committee subcommittee was going to be looking at the reparations question on Juneteenth. 
It's the, it's the demand of the masses, the people that's forced the, the Democratic Party candidates to start talking about reparations. That's forced Forbes magazine to talk about re, uh, reparations, to force the Wall Street Journal to write about it, to force the New York Times to write about it. Unless, unless you are some kind of religious person who thinks again that some epiphany suddenly uh, descended on the, uh, those who uh, have or uh, are fighting to uh, have uh, white power domination over the rest of us in the world. It's the people, it's the people, it's the people, and that's where we have always gone, take it to the people. And we've always recognized once, the, once reparation demand uh, is something that's in the possession of the people, then the government and its institutions have no choice but to try to address it, if only to quiet the people, if only to find a way to get a poverty program or a welfare scheme to keep the people from fighting to take the power away from the Congress and from the United States government itself. So we say, uh, so we said that the tribunal had been in the building stages for the past year. As the African People's Socialist Party established committees across the U.S. to build awareness for the upcoming tribunal, to gather thousands of reparation claims by individual Africans to be presented at the tribunal, to assemble evidence and international support for the tribunal. Participants from these committees arrived from Seattle, Maryland, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, Oakland, St. Petersburg, and New York, while others, uh, committees uh, who intended to come ended up unable for, to for logistical reasons, including from Miami, uh, people from Miami, Chicago, and Memphis, the breadth of African organizations and other colonized peoples who endorsed the tribunal was truly inspirational and showed the great support which the reparations demand can win. And participation in the tribunal itself was equally as broad. Queen Mother Moore of the Association of Ethiopian Women and an activist in the struggle for reparations since her days working with, in the Garvey movement sat in the front row of the auditorium with a number of her associates from across the U.S. During the entire two days of hearings, members of the National Black uh, United uh, Front Black Vets for Social Justice, Grand Jury Product, and many other community groups fighting for African freedom were in evidence, along with unaffiliated Africans and some progressive North Americans. Notably absent were the white ideological imperialists and professors of revolution who clog up so many progressive events, uh, for this was a tribunal established by African working people on our own terms. But working class and struggling African people predominated. On the first day, over 200 people signed in, not as many as hoped for, but representing a strong cross-section of our people. Coverage from the African media, from the Amsterdam News to the APSPs, the Burning Spear, helped to amplify the impact of the tribunal. The International Panel of Judges, as well as the International Observers, were primarily African people, reflecting the solid international solidarity which Garvey had mobilized with the slogan, Africa for Africans, those at home and those abroad. Among the observers were Kasim Ashburn of the Black American Law Students Association, Ike Mfoli of the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania, a, uh, which is South Africa, a representative of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, and Sue Valles, who works with the Solidarity Movement with Chile. As for the international judges, two of them had traveled considerable distances and faced harassment and repression from the U.S. repressive forces for their work on the tribunal. The important figure in the African struggle in the Caribbean, uh, Pianki uh, Ladapu uh, uh, Salanki, uh, chairman of the National United Movement of Barbados and the representative of the revolutionary Senegalese community in exile in France, Samba Mbou, uh, in addition to a representative of the Congolese National Liberation Front, which is waging armed struggle against the puppet Mobutu regime. Serge uh, Mukunde was in attendance as a judge, along with representatives of North American progressive people, Rick Ayers, and the chairman of the Committee in Solidarity with African Independence. Two other African representatives who were eager to attend as judges, uh, Rosie Douglas, uh, Secretary General of the United Labor Party of uh, uh, Dominica, 
and MWK Chiume, uh, chairman of the Congress for the Second Republic in Malawi, were prevented from entering the U.S. by visa denial in the first case and by economic constraints of the travel from Africa in the second. Unfortunately, it was never possible to get a firm commitment from a representative judge from native people in the U.S. Uh, or from Colombia, and the uh, promise uh, participation by a representative of the Puerto Rican Socialist Party and the new Casa El Salvador, Farabundi Mati, uh, fell through in the last days. The importance of international participation and international solidarity from these and other people struggling against U.S. imperialism must be won, as African people have always demonstrated a high degree of internationalism and sacrifice in the common struggle against imperialism, these and other international allies of our struggle will have an opportunity to come forward to participate in future tribunals which our people will sponsor. With all these different peoples present, as well as the range of activists and witnesses to genocide from the African community who brought forth testimony, truly the black liberation movement was fully represented at the International Tribunal. And while our movement has many different tendencies and contending strategies, something profound occurred over the two days of the tribunal. As the testimony was unraveled, as the death of the crimes of U.S. imperialism were laid before those assembled, the continual focus provided by the People's Advocate APSP Chairman Omali Ishitela brought forth again and again that the anti-colonial struggle of African people the struggle that targets the U.S. government as our enemy and unites with the anti-colonial struggles around the world and the demand for reparations now is a unifying, mobilizing, and militant cry which will put our movement back on the offensive. The tribunal built unity in our movement, not a liberal unity based on nothing but accommodation and passivity, but a unity born out of a common focus and a struggle com and a growing commitment to join together to boldly advance our struggle against the U.S. government. <coughs> the tribunal was open on Saturday, November 13th, with a procession of the judges and opening remarks by a people's advocate, Omali Ishitela. He explained that the tribunal would be held under international law that the International Panel of Judges had a legal responsibility to weigh the evidence in coming to their verdict, and that African people do have a right to call such a tribunal. Even though we do not have state power, we are a people who have been wronged and have a right to petition for redress, as well as to struggle for state power in order to achieve that redress. Excuse me. Following this, the first witness was called in order to establish that a crime had been committed by showing that African people were in a positive state of existence before the kidnapping of African people which began in the 15th century. Dr. Leonard Jeffries, chairman of the Black Studies Department of the City University of New York, spoke for an hour and a half, giving the greatest detailed account of African history that could be condensed into that time. He defied the question raised by the patronizing academics of the West as to whether Africans had made any contributions to civilization by assessing that civilization itself is African. The very beginning of human prehistory as well as the proto-historical period in which social organization and production were begun and the classical period in which the basic science and humanities were developed were all African. What bare civilization that did exist in Europe was a derivative from Africa in the ancient era and in subsequent historical periods. Dr. Jeffries drew out in great detail the seven periods of African history and described the techniques used by the Europeans first, the Portuguese and Spanish, later the English to assault and bleed the African continent. He points out how Europe in the, in the 15th century being land poor, resource poor, and people poor, pursued piracy and theft from other peoples as a primary way of moving beyond subsistence economy and build the riches uh, 
civilization uh, and found the riches. So, I'm sorry, let me go back. He points out how Europe in the 15th century, being land poor, resource poor, and people poor, pursued piracy and theft from other peoples as the primary way of moving beyond subsistence economy and found the richest civilization in Africa. Unable to penetrate the strong societies on the continent, they settled on the beaches and began a process of kidnapping individuals, who, uh, individuals which eventually weakened and subjugated the whole continent. In 1482, the Portuguese established their first slave, uh, slave uh, military fort on the, on, the, on the coast of Ghana at Elmina, uh, Elmina and of St. George. Uh, one of the builders of this fort was Christopher Columbus. Over the next decades, Portugal set up 50 fortified forts and castles on the coast of Ghana alone. The slave trade was the basis for the establishment of a world economy and provided the basic capital for the industrialization of Europe and later the U.S. After documenting the 400 years of de degradation and exploitation at the hands of the Europeans, Dr. Jeffries concluded by describing the years from 1900 to today as the period of the African Renaissance and Revolution, in which African people on the continent and around the world have moved to seize back our destinies and our resources. Following his presentation, Dr. Jeffries followed the tribunal format by answering questions from the People's Advocate and the panel of judges, which would explain areas needing further detail for the judges' de deliberations. Following a lunch recess and press conference, the tribunal resumed with the statement of charges, uh, indictment of the U.S. government. At this time, People's Advocate Omali Ishitela reviewed the pertinent international law, law which was designed to prevent the barbarity of genocide and colonialism, law which un underscored the justice of our struggle for liberation. He read the law which had been provided to, in the judges' packets and the press packets. The International Bill on Human Rights, which includes the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Economic, uh, uh, Social, and Cultural Rights, and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial dis Discrimination. The Convention on the uh, Prevention and Punishment of the Crimes of Genocide. The Charter of the United Nations. The Statue of the International Court of Justice and the Foreign Relations Law of the U.S. Participating, uh, anticipating the testimony that was to follow, the People's Advocate summed up in broad strokes the case against the U.S. government. Wherever we, there are African people in the U.S., there's forced sterilization, high infant death rates, disproportionate imprisonment, political terror, police terror, subhuman housing. These are just some of the conditions that make up the, the conditions of domestic colonization which Africans suffer in the U.S. This oppression is historic, as is the struggle against such conditions. And clearly the present condition of African people has a direct relation to the loss of self-determination as the condition of African people today have their origin in the trade in African flesh. Following the statement of charges uh, was supposed to be testimony from SNCC founder Ella Baker on the Southern struggle for democratic rights. Unfortunately, the comrade was not able to attend because of health reasons, so she sent her greetings and solidarity. The next witness was from Gwen Wilson of the National Black United Front, who put forth evidence on the case of Eddie Cochran, Carthen, uh, the progressive black mayor of Chula, uh, Mississippi. Eddie Carthen was elected in 1977 because of strong uh, black community support and immediately began to defy the white power structure by refusing a $10,000 bribe and working to save the city medical clinic, uh, which was being cut, cut back. When Carthen tried to fire racist police chief Clark, the righteous on the city council decreased his pay to $60 a month and began setting him up for legal charges. First, they charged him with assaulting the police chief and later trying to connect him with any robbery or killing that occurred in Tishula. Because of national and international support, Mayor, Mayor Kath Carthen was acquitted uh, of the recent murder charges, but is still in prison over the alleged assault. 
The National Black United Front representative explained that the organization is involved in struggles for the rights of black people all over the U.S. She pointed out that the attack on Eddie Carthen is part of a political repression seeking to destroy meager black gains of the Civil Rights Movement, just as the Black Reconstruction Gains era was smashed after the Civil War. Any illusion of gradual progress for Africans in the U.S. is refuted by the statistics on black education, employment, pay, imprisonment, and by such stories as that of Mayor Eddie Carthen of Tashula, Mississippi. Following uh, Sister Wilson, Professor Dell Hunter of Medgar Edwards College of uh, the City University of New York came forth to give testimony of the struggle for African education. Professor Hunter Hart had worked as an assistant dean for a year, but was removed when he came down on the, on the side of the African students who were fighting over the last year to remove a reactionary black petty bourgeois president and establish a progressive administration. Mega Evers College represents the typical type of educational institution reserved for African students. Located in the heart of Brownsville and Brooklyn, the college is underfunded and allows no control by the immediate African community. Professor Hunter pointed out that it is always necessary for an oppressive ruling class to control knowledge and values. The purpose of universities is that is, 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 is first, uh, the discovery, production, and distribution of knowledge, and second, to, to reproduce a class of people with responsibility uh, to see that knowledge is passed on. When Africans were first brought to the New World, we were not allowed to read or study or develop uh, the arts. Within the, with the end of child slavery, the ruling class came up with a strategy of creating the Negro out of Africans in an attempt to internalize our subjugated status. The U.S. ruling class has set up a black petty bourgeois class of intellectuals and mediocre schools like Mega, Ever Co Mega Evers College so that African students are not engaged in institutions that discover and produce knowledge related to our needs. Instead, we are required to simply repeat, repeat the point of view and values handed down by the dominant North American powers. Although African students want some black studies departments during uh, the Black Power Wars of the 1960s. They have been underfinanced and under, undermined so that black people still do not have our own institutions, have not been able to redefine our mission. It, was, it will require revolution of all U.S. society before Africans can get a real education, and part of the struggle for revolution is African people creating our own base of knowledge. During questions by the People's Advocate and the judges, Professor Hunter reviewed the role of the black church, the struggle by the oppressors to suppress African heritage and cosmology, and stated that black intellectuals can and must make a contribution to the struggle of African people in the U.S. for nationality. Next to testify was the Honorable Job Mashariki, Chairman of the uh, Black Veterans for Social Justice. Comrade Mashariki, spoke representing the thousands of Africans who have been sent to wars by the U.S. ruling class since the war for independence against Britain, who have been promised their freedom on each occasion, have only suffered the highest casualties, lowest benefits, and constant armed harassment. He opened his remarks thus, and I'm quoting uh, Joe Mashariki here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it is an honor to be among such a noble and august body. We know that you have traveled far and inconvenienced yourself to be present here on this historic occasion to give our organization and our people an opportunity to vent our longstanding grievances against this government. To present our grievances against this government. And the government included the Congress. We hope our short testimony will contribute to your inevitable conclusion that the U.S. government is guilty of mass genocide and degradation against Africans here in America. Our organization has known this fact for centuries. History has taught us 
history, historically, black people have always fought for this country inside and outside of the military. The economic wealth and development of this country was built on the backs of black slave labor. All persons who enjoy the fruits of so-called democracy today enjoy it at the expense of black blood, sweat, tears, and lives. See, this is the, we've already done the study. <laughs> the study has already been done. Uh, but Joe Mashariki would never have been brought before that congressional hearing. As an organization of black veterans from World War II uh, to the Vietnam War who fought in, those, in these wars, our mo motto is, blacks fight no one else's war no more. We have adopted this motto because of our experience in this country. However, this motto doesn't exclude us from fighting our own war. I want to be clear on that, such as in Azania, Namibia, Mississippi, or New York." Unquote. In the course of reviewing the criminal history of the U.S. government treatment of Africans in the U.S. military, Comrade Mashariki brought out many profound facts to underline his argument. For instance, while black GIs suffered disproportionate casualties in Vietnam because the officers placed us in the line of withering fire, Vietnam veterans faced the highest unemployment rate in the U.S. for that age group, and African veterans have the highest rate among these. The military gave 257,000 less. The military, the, I'm sorry, the, uh, the military gave uh, 250,000 less than honorable discharges. Okay, the military gave 257,000 less than honorable discharges to Vietnam vets in order to punish the defiant or strong and deny them all veterans benefits. Although of these, 300 and, uh, three quarters are black and Latin, Africans have had to fight on two fronts overseas and in the U.S. as the suppression of African soldiers in Brownsville, Texas testifies to. In fact, prior to World War I, more black people have, had been killed by the KKK than in U.S. wars. Many statistics are hard to uncover. And in fact, members of Black Veterans for Social Justice were barred from the Pentagon when they went there seeking statistics on black casualties, tools of duty, and discharges. Finally, in response to questions, Comrade Mashariki pointed out that Africans in the military have always provided the backbone of resistance to imperialist military ventures and gave real heart to the slogan, hell no, we won't go. The next witness was African revolutionary health activist Ebun Adelona. Sister Adelona pointed out forcefully the ways health is too often neglected or looked at from a narrow perspective. She stated, we quote, we are involved in the struggle for the health of the people, for the health of the people, and we see the struggle for health as one of the most basic and fundamental because if you do not have a people that are healthy, you do not have a people that can engage in any kind of struggle in any of the areas that we struggle in. We cannot wage a liberation struggle without a people that are healthy. You cannot wage an armed struggle if you're not able to take care of the health of the people. You cannot in any way move forward if you are dealing with health, unquote. Comrade Adelona proceeded to bring forth the most extensive documentation of the health status of African people in New York and throughout the U.S. in order to demonstrate further our right to reparations. She pointed out that the, for African women, negative pregnancy outcomes are highest and infant mortality rate are at least 36 percent higher than whites. In many cases, African activists have had to carry out independent research block by block studies to uncover the causes of African health oppression. The, the studies have been done. Um, often such studies reveal the relations between health status and the environment. For example, studies on the high asthma rate for African children suggest an association with the high incidence of roaches in apartments rented to Africans and an emergent 
and an allergic reaction to roach droppings in the children. Studies of people who freeze to death in the winter require extensive work since the Department of Health of New York masked such tragedies by listing the cause of death as heart failure. She testified about the ways uh, that the multi-billion dollar health industry and the government are conspiring to provide less services to Africans while concentrated on the lucrative white middle class market, thus pushing the African population below the survival level, meaning genocide. For instance, bankruptcies are, uh, uh, of hospitals are the result of government pulling back uh, funding sources. Of the 48 hospital closings nationally this year, 39 serve the predominantly black population. What more studies do they need? I mean this. I mean, uh, of the $10.7 billion spent in New York City for medical facilities in 1980, more than 90% went to support a little string of hospitals in the wealthy east side. In Manhattan, the city closed the uh, Sydenham Hospital in Harlem uh, because it was allegedly operating on a deficit. <laughs> you don't hear the term deficit in relation to the Mammoth Police Department budget. Comrade Adelona pointed out the ways through the ways struggle to save Sydenham, Sydenham a hospital had, had documented the state's uh, complicity in genocide. This and other hospital closings means death for African people, paved the way for gentrification of African neighborhoods. This is 1982. This is 1982. And we had the Congress asking for a study? I mean, uh, check the old bit pages in your local newspapers and what have you, if you still have them. So again, you know, we're not knocking the fact that people go to these other institutions, but we're saying that from our perspective, this is the African People's Socialist Party. This is a revolutionary organization that presupposes that African people never, 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 never know of freedom and control of our own resources until we have power. This is an organization that understands in order to get power, we're going to have to take it. This is an organization that sees, yes, the demand for reparations is critical, and we have led around this struggle more than any. There's no organization in this country or the world that has taken the reparations demand with such intensity and as far and wide as the African People's Socialist Party has done. So we, we believe, however, that rep reparations has to be a function of the revolution, that we have to have power of our own lives, and we're not, the Congress is not going to give us that. The courts are not going to give us that. And that while we can take it to the Congress and take it to the courts, we believe in the African People's Socialist Party, the things that would even make a Congress or a court act like they're considering the question of reparations is the people who are organized to manage and say we're going to get reparations either one way or the other. One way or the other. We're taking what belongs to us. And Africans are beginning increasingly to recognize that when a white person opens the refrigerator, it's, it's about our food. When they drive on a street in Manhattan, it's the street that should be in Sierra Leone or the street that should be in Lagos. Uh, we recognize that increasingly and increasingly as the masses of people on the streets, in our communities, in the places where we have been gentrified out of existence, when this people understand that reparations are due us, we'll take it. We'll make reparations happen, not because of the goodwill or good wishes of the Congress or any other institution. So, we say that... Uh, Uh, we go back to the struggle to save uh, Sydenham Hospital and document the state's complicity in genocide. This and other hospital closing means death for African people, pave the way for gentrification in African, of African neighborhoods by killing off the inhabitants and create a captive population which must act at the will of the government planners. African people are in the struggle to get decent health care for our people while breaking from the ideological definitions of health processes which have evolved by capitalism in the pursuit of profit. 
Much more documentation was provided uh, in written form, including the important areas of mental health, sterilization, and abortion rights. Unfortunately, Dr. John Bowling, director of the uh, Mandela, Mandela uh, Center and member of the Association of Black Psychiatrists, was forced to leave for another commitment when the tribunal testimony was running late. Unable to testify, Dr. Bowling submitted his testimony in writing on the effects of uh, oppression in the U.S. on African psychology. The last witness to testify before the International Tribunal on Saturday was Mafundi Lake, Lake, one of the hundreds of the heroic inmates for action uh, in Al Atmore and Holman prisons in Alabama and a longtime African prison resistor. Brother Mafundi came forward and remarked that this was the first time he had been before a judge when he wasn't on trial himself. He then proceeded to recount through personal experience the damning proof that prison functioned as a form of genocide, that it serves the same function as those terroristic slave drivers known as nigger breakers because they were assigned the responsibility of breaking the will and resistance of Africans who would not submit to slavery. He exposed the ways the prisons of Alabama and in the rest of the U.S. used terroristic violence and uh, isolation to break the spirit. Mufundi himself served 13 years of a 13-year sentence for a $38 robbery he did not commit. In all, he showed how the prison, prisons represent ex extensive behavior modification centers based on crude techniques of reward and punishment. Comrade Mufundi also brought out the ways Africans have managed to fight back and act more. The African prisoner of, uh, prisoners formed Inmates for Action, which was both a military resistance formation committed to establish conditions in which Africans could survive <laughs> by threatening and taking retaliatory method, measures against guards and white lackeys, as well as being a political cultural formation which would raise the consciousness and sense of purpose among African prisoners. The IFA, Inmates for Action, proved to be the strongest prison formation in the South and organized work stoppages as well as ending the degrading yes sir, no sir stance that African prisoners had been forced to take with the guards. Finally, with the overall decline of the Black Power movement in the 1970s because of government military assault, the prison authorities were unable to break down the inmates for action. They transferred leaders like Mufundi out of the prison and brutally murdered many others, such as Frank X. Moore. Those who took up the struggle at, in Atmore and Holman, however, have not been entirely wiped out, and the struggling African people keep coming back. Although prison leaves physical and mental scars on all Africans who have been subjected to it, it also educated our people to the terms and seriousness of the struggle. Uh, International Judge Samba Mboub asked Mufundi about the use of prisoners as involuntary laborers. Mufundi pointed out that Atmore Prison, for example, is a multi-million dollar agricultural industry producing all types of farm products which are marketed by capitalist businesses, even though the prisoners get to eat none of the fresh food produced. Kasim Ashborn of Balsa asked if Mufundi tried to organize his more recent, uh, in his more recent period in prison, and if he found some of the brothers to be unreachable. Comrade Mufundi, a true organizer and people's leader, said he never found anyone who was unreachable. He pointed out the fact that the movement is in a weakened state today, but there is always another battle to take on and structures to rebuild and strengthen. During his uh, entire testimony, you could hear a pin drop in the auditorium. So dramatic and moving was his story. When finished, the audience gave him the tribute of sustained applause, and he left the witness stand to handshakes from those present. So uh, if one day had condensed so many aspects of our people's oppression and exposed so many aspects of our struggle for liberation from health care to prison system, to the military, to the schools. It was simply evidentiary overkill to conduct an entire second day of hearings that, and testimony 
In fact, however many days could be conducted of this tribunal, and it, would be, it could be convened in every black community in the country and have lines of our people waiting eagerly to present testimony. So uh, the second day of the testimony of, at the tri International Tribunal of Reparations for Black People in the U.S. opened with an explanation by the People's Advocate, APSP Chairman Omali Shetela, on the historical brief which was being presented to the international judges. This historical brief, 58 pages long, was presented under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party to summarize extensive research on the history of stolen labor and wealth from African people in the past 400 years. The brief looks at three historical periods, chattel slavery from 1619 to 1865, southern peasant labor from 1865 to 1945, and urbanization and proletarianization of the African domestic colony from 1945 to today. <clears throat> This research explained in great detail how the primitive accumulation of capitalism was carried out on the backs of African people and the colonizations of Africans in the U.S. provided the basic wealth of capitalists in every period in, of history. I want to say, because this is critical, because people want to talk about reparations today. This is what the party has brought to this discussion, that you can't talk about reparation as something that's due to Africans solely uh, because of slavery. That the entire foundation of resource and wealth generation in the international community, the entire capitalist social system has its birth. It was birthed by the cruel uh, enslavement of African people. This is where it all came from. So yes, you know, you've all the cotton we picked, yeah, we, we owed for all of that. Uh, et cetera, but we are owed for all of the stuff that we didn't do on the continent of Africa. We're owed for all the labor that was stolen from Africa itself. That's why some of these Negroes who are running around talking about reparations just don't include Africans on the continent of Africa. Uh, serious problems. Uh, so, uh, uh, so we, while we were uh, picking cotton uh, uh, in Mississippi, we were not uh, building infrastructure and creating uh, the kind of society that we were supposed to be having in Africa. In fact, it was undermined, it was destroyed and what have you. Uh, and when we talk about uh, reparations, we're not just talking about uh, uh, stolen labor, we're talking about the fact that every university that exists in this country, uh, first of all, was created through uh, the labor of African people. And much of the knowledge and understanding that's in those universities was stolen from African people. And the fact that so many white people could go to the university was made possible because niggas was out there picking cotton and doing the work that they didn't have to do. We were owed for all of that. We owe for an entire social system that rests upon the slavery. So there ain't nothing that's there. The only ones who are owed are the African people and the indigenous people upon whose land we were forced to labor for nothing. It's, a, it's, a, it's more than just, you know, we was in slavery and what have you. The whole social system. And that says something about the nature of the system itself and whether or not we would want to actually have an affiliation and be a relationship to this kind of system, a system that has its origin born from slavery and genocide and colonization. And that's not the system that we want to inherit. We want our freedom, we want our resources back, we want everything that's been produced by all of our ancestors and everything that's reproduced itself, and also we want to be paid for the fact that white people don't have to listen to elevator music, and when they listen to elevator music, even that was stolen from black people. That this is what needs to be recognized and understood, and that means you don't get this by, by some congressional vote. You get this by overturning the system that continues to suck our lives, suck our blood, and then create new social system that can make it possible for human beings to live as human beings. That's what our movement has been about. And we understand that the power is in the people who produce all the value. Not the, not the ones who didn't produce anything and collect off it, nor is it produced, nor is the power or should the power be in the position of those from our own communities who have benefited from the colonial relationship and are more educated and more prominent and more all these other things at, our, at the expense of everybody else. 
the ones who social, socially produce all the value who need to be socially in charge and in control of all the value. That's what socialism is. And it can only come about as a consequence of overthrowing colonial domination of African people. And part of the, the profound struggle to overthrow the colonial domination of African people is the reparations demand. We want it back, and you want, the Congress can't give it to you. And that's the thing that needs to be understood. In fact, the Congress itself is controlled uh, by the forces who steal all the value. That's who hires them. That's who put them, puts them uh, in the places where they're located. And I don't care what color they are. They can't get elected, generally speaking, uh, without that kind of support unless they build real people's movement. And real people's movement uh, will have been leading a demonstration at the Congress uh, saying that uh, this is what we demand. Uh, and if we don't get it, ain't going to be no more Congress or something to that effect anyway. So uh, let me see what we're dealing with in terms of time, because we are going to leave some time to speak, uh, to talk. And it's just really important, I think, to everybody to read this, this document. This is, like I said, we're dealing with uh, what should, could be considered the first two chapters of this. We're going to do some more uh, next week, and we're going to keep talking about this reparation demand and reparation question, because it's clearly one that's not fully understood. And we played a role and pushing it forward so that everybody could participate in saying, yes, reparation, yes, reparation. Now it's the responsibility of the African People's Socialist Party and revolutionaries to take this demand and make this demand something that's active and actively understood and acted on uh, by African people who are in these communities being gentrified, who are in these prisons, who are going to the prison if they're there, not there already, uh, the ones who they sucking into the US military to try to get a job, go kill people uh, around the world so that they can be subjugated. This is our responsibility because in the final analysis, what's gonna make the determination of reparations is when African people are armed and organized to take it. And the demand, the fact that the US Congress is forced to talk about it, then it uh, puts it uh, before greater numbers of African people who are alerted to the reparations question. Now it's our responsibility to define reparations for the masses of our people, uh, where the, the politician, Danny Glover, is not gonna be hanging out in these communities where we do this work, unless he's under some kind of serious guards. It's our responsibility, and this is not a throwdown on Danny. Danny, he's done some you know, relatively progressive stuff and we kinda like him. He used to eat, in fact, at Uhuru uh, Cafe and Bakery uh, in Oakland, California, when he was there. And you know, uh, that's not to say that's the only basis of his significance, but he did do some relatively progressive work. Uh, so, um, the second day of the testimony again, uh, uh, at the International Tribunal of Reparations for Black People in the U.S., opened with an ex explanation of the people's, by the people's advocate, APSP Chairman Omali Chitello of the historical brief that was being presented to the international judges. This historical brief, 58 pages long, was prepared under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party to summarize uh, extensive research of the, of the, of the, on the history of stolen labor and wealth from African people, and it went through uh, for the past 400 years. Looks, uh, the brief looks at three historical periods, chattel slavery from 18, 1619 to 1865, Southern peasant labor from 1865 to 1945, uh, and, and urbanization and proletarianization of the African domestic colony from 1945 to today. This research explained in great detail how the primitive accumulation of capitalism was carried out in the backs of African people and the colonization of Africans in the US, provided the basic wealth of capitalism in every period of history, and the fact and, the, and in fact, the amount of wealth uh, extracted from Africans has increased over the centuries. This research has proved that even by conservative estimates, African people uh, owed $4.1 trillion. That's $4,100 billion by, by the US government for stolen labor alone. And this was an extremely uh, conservative uh, 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 calculation. Following the historic uh, 
the historical brief, Kwame Braithwaite of the Patrice Lumumba uh, Coalition and the African Jazz Art uh, Studio uh, came uh, forward to present testimony on the theft of African culture. Brother Braithwaite uh, reviewed the capital offenses and were committed, that were committed by the Europeans in kidnapping African people. He pointed out that the kidnappers did not just take laborers, but also uh, scientists, uh, teachers, and peoples, uh, healers, and leaders. In other words, they stole the culture by attempting to destroy it in Africa and outlawing this uh, practice of African culture in the Americas. In addition, African cultural expressions such as jazz, blues, and other forms have been taken over by white capitalists, and even black practitioners are dependent on white promoters, club owners, and record companies to make a living today. Moreover, these capitalists set the terms for the type of culture that comes up, that comes out, suppressing such rhythm and blues songs as unity and wake up everybody and don't call me brother while promoting uh, countless words like I love music, <laughs> uh, con contentless words like I love music. He called for Africans to seize back our culture and develop self-sufficiency so that we can build our own national identity and struggle. The next witness call was Penny Hess of the Committee in Solidarity with African Independence, a North American uh, or white woman uh, who was called to give testimony uh, on the political stand of the white working class and the potential for internationalist uh, solidarity between African and North American people. She gave testimony on her work over the past six years in campaigns led by the African People's Socialist Party which called for solidarity and support from the North American population, including the African National Prison Organization Solidarity Committee and the Desi Woods Support Committee, as well as solidarity work in the International Reparations Tribunal. She brought out the basic truth that African people are colonized inside the U.S. and therefore provide a buffer for the North American working class since the brunt of the attacks and exploitation from the U.S. government is aimed at the African community. Uh, for this reason, there is, progressive, there is, there is no progressive uh, uh, movement possible in the U.S. without solidarity with the struggle of Africans for independence. And so in order to go beyond a cynical bargain with the capitalist class for the division of colonial spoils, North American workers must have the courage to build strong solidarity with the African people's demand for reparations uh, in giving through thorough testimony uh, to uh, the real class interests of North American workers for revolution and the reactionary choices that have so often been taken by North Americans because of the material benefits they derive from colonialism, Comrade Hess strongly exposed the international importance of the African anti-colonial struggle. While the African struggle for independence has so often been betrayed by North Americans, sometimes especially those who profess to come forward to give solidarity, to our struggle, the honest and courageous testimony by Penny Hess was a welcome expression of solidarity. She was questioned at length by the international judges to learn, uh, the, uh, uh, learn of the kinds of U.S. state attacks and solid, uh, the solidarity movement has suffered, the efforts that, that are being uh, made uh, to win uh, North Americans to solidarity, the way the Solidarity Committee takes on the political expose of the so-called multinational leftist organizations and how reactionary movements in the white community are being uh, countered. The next witness was Afeni Shakur, a former member of the Black Panther Party in New York who was jailed and tried uh, in the Cointel Pro-led uh, Panther 21 case in 1968 to 70, 69 to 71. She is working now in the Grand Jury product, Project to counter U.S. state attacks on the African struggle. After pointing out that she was testifying not as an expert, but as a victim of Cointel Pro, Sister Afeni proceeded to give the most detailed account of the functioning of the U.S. government's repressive apparatus against the black liberation struggle. As Tupac's mama, y'all. Uh, she uh, expressed, she uh, exposed that the Quarantel program of the FBI is a military operation with specific functions, goals, and objectives to neutralize a hostile people's movement because of the mass resistance of black people in the U.S. 
The U.S. government has murdered thousands of our youth and attacked our community, which resulted in such, change, uh, such uh, changing statistics as the fact that the New York prison population was 30% 30 30 African in 1956 and is 80% African today. This is in 1982. In struggling to free such uh, political prisoners and prisoners of war, Sundiata Akoli, Geronimo Pratt, Sophia Bukhari, uh, Daruba Moore, Herman Bell, Newell Washington, and Anthony Bottoms, the black movement has been trying for a long time to gain international support and awareness. The only international examination we have been able to get was from Amnesty International, which issued the proposal for a commission of inquiry into the effects of domestic intelligence actions on criminal trials within the United States. Uh, Comrade Afeni brought out information about some of the most notorious traitors and informers our movement has had to deal with. For example, uh, Gene Roberts was a New York and federal government informer when he worked with uh, Malcolm X, even acting as his bodyguard and the pretending to give Malcolm mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation at the Audubon uh, Ballroom when he was assassinated in 1965. Roberts then went on to infiltrate the Black Panthers, using his credentials as a trusted security cadre for Malcolm X, and set up the arrest of the Panther 21. Uh, likewise, the security cadre in the Chicago Panthers, who set up the murder of Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, uh, was a pig named O'Neill, who supplemented his informer's pay with armed robberies he was never prosecuted for. Uh, when asked by Ladapu uh, Solanke of Barbados how she suggested we keep informers out of our organization, uh, Sister Afeni replied, quote, uh, I can't give uh, the last word. I can only give this word. But it is uh, really my opinion that in reality this is not something that can be prevented. That in the history of any people's liberation movement, I do not believe anyone has ever been able to eliminate this possibility. By the revelation, revelation of these things, people are made to be more careful. But my whole point about the case of Gene Roberts is that I am not sure how much more careful anybody could have been around that particular person. And that uh, to me, uh, and that to me is really a great example of how, even though most people should remember how, uh, how paranoid the Panthers were, people would be searched before they could come in and when someone would be speaking, there would be people here on all sides. But in fact, what I have found to be true is that there is no way to prevent infiltration. What we have to, what we have, to have as our priority is, first of all, we've got to know that we are fighting a just war. We have got to know that our struggle is just. We have got to be personally and individually be moral people. Uh, we can't be corrupt. You obviously, uh, uh, you know, because it's in the areas of corruption that we are most vulnerable. It is in our areas of weakness, weakness that where we have uh, vices and are most apt to be corrupted and thereby subverted. Uh, so for each one of us that is serious, we should really have to be a moral people. Not that we should <clears throat> not be concerned <clears throat> about agents, you know, but I know uh, for me, I'm sure that I come across agents every day of my life, and the only defense that I have is that I have made up my mind that I'm going to fight this until it's over, and nobody's going to infiltrate me and get me off my point. Word. That was Afeni Shakur's testimony. Um, After extensive uh, further testimony covering the current grand jury investigation of the Brinks uh, expropriation of last year and the attacks on such freedom fighters as Sekou Odinga, Sister Afeni entertained more questions. International observers like Mofoli of the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania asked about the Panther community programs. He said, uh, it is clear the methods used here are the same as in South Africa, but the goal of the total physical liquidation of the movement. These are not short-term, they are long-term goals. Therefore, we should also accept that our struggle is a long and protracted and arduous one. I would like to ask what happened to the Black Panther program that built the mass movement, programs which were also adopted by the Black Consciousness Movement in Africa and which today gives a mass base and ongoing strength to our struggle. 
unquote. He described how the dual power institutions of the African population of Zania were inspired by the Black Panther movement in the U.S. and the Panther Breakfast for Children program, medical clinics, etc. And these dual power institutions allowed the African struggle to maintain uh, continuity to produce new leaders when Steve Biko and others were murdered. Sister Afeni responded that uh, it is one of the sorrows of my life that we lost th these programs. We don't do it enough and as forcefully as we should. She explained how the African Revolution requires both a strong, both strong community institutional base and the capacity to defend it. Uh, the Black Panther Party was overwhelmed by a massive military assault, but the black movement continues to build all levels of the struggle. Following a break for lunch, People's Advocate Omali Ishitela called, for, called the court to session and welcomed formerly Queen Mother Moore and set out and put into evidence the reparations claim which African people had made in 1962 against the U.S. government. Then Akil Aljundi, an Attica brother who was involved in rebellion in 1971 at Attica Prison in New York <clears throat> and continues working today in the fight for black freedom, was called to the witness stand. Comrade Akil uh, greeted the tribunal on behalf of the 61 revolutionaries who were tried for the Attica rebellion and the 43 who were murdered by the military assault ordered by New York uh, Governor Nelson Rockefeller on September 13, 1971. The U.S. Congress is not going to hear Akil talk about Rockefeller murdering those brothers and Attica. He put forth for a matter of record the names of comrades killed in Attica and the cause of death as reported by the McCabe Commission. Such dear and brave heroes as William Allen and L.D. Barkley, John Barnes, Allen Durham, William Fuller, Melvin Gray, Tommy Hicks, Emmanuel Johnson, Lorenzo McNeil, Ramon Riviera, Rivera, uh, Santiago Santos, and Rafael uh, Vasquez. Brother Akil Aljuni revealed that the widows of the prison guards killed in the military assault at Attica recently won reparations of $1.6 million from the state because they proved that excessive force had been used in taking the prison. He said that the families of the Attica victims are pursuing a 2.8 billion civil suit uh, against the Rockefeller estate because of the wrongful deaths which have already been s established by the white guards' families. Akil presented a copy of this suit to the international body to be entered into the documentation to be taken before the world uh, in African people's struggles for reparation. Comrade Akil testified that the Africans held in prison in the U.S stand in strong solidarity with the African and other colonized peoples in the world, such as the revolutionary African people of Grenada. And we join the people of the world in saying, we will no longer be a colony. He concluded, quote, I want to say to the chairman, Omali Shetela, to the international observers, to the international justice jurists, we thank you for allowing us to be a part of this tribunal seeking rep reparations. The Germans have had to pay reparations to the Jews because of their dastardly acts against these people, those people. The Japanese raised the same question here in the United States of America, seeking reparations from this government. No one, no one on the face of the planet Earth has been witness to the dastardly acts, the brutalizing acts, the hatred, the level of racism. You go, can go from A to Z. No one has borne witness to it, such as the African people who happen to occupy this part of the planet Earth. In the United States of America, so if anyone on the face of the planet has the right to seek reparations, then you know that we definitely should be on the top of the list. And so to those persons who assume responsibility to formulate the teachings that were being held throughout the United States to raise the issue again in this part of the century, because we are at the end of the 20th century, and Sister Afeni spoke of her young son and daughter, whom I have the honor to know. We want them to know that the issue of reparations is a valid issue within the struggle of our liberation. So whenever there is a call around the issue of reparations, there's a need for all of us to be as supportive as we can, for us to try to bring our friends, people from our workplaces, our families, to an event such as this, because it has historical significance, yes, the auditorium is not filled up with 50,000 people, but each of us represent 50,000 people and more. So it is not always the quantity uh, that determines the significance of the feat of the tenability of what people are attending, attempting to do. 
It has to do with the quality, uh, with the efforts that are put forth by the people that assume the responsibility to do that, unquote. So, uh, so we had uh, other speakers, um, uh, Makil uh, Shakur uh, from the San Francisco Committee to Build uh, the Reparations Tribunal. This is, uh, uh, these are committees that we had established in different places around the United States. Uh, we had testimony from Lester Lewis from the Caribbean uh, People's Organization in London, England. Uh, uh, on the struggles of Africans uh, in, in Britain and the Caribbean. Uh, we had struggles from Shadahidi of St. Petersburg committed to build the Black Rep Reparations Tribunal. Uh, talked about the history of the police attacks on African people in that part of Florida. Oronde Takuma from the New York Reparations Tribunal Committee testified on the work of the New York Committee to gather evidence concerning the case of Africans for reparations. We had uh, the Oakland, California Reparations Tribunal Committee uh, two people gave te uh, testimony. Uh, Calvin, Evers, uh, Calvin Edward Evans testified on the case of police murder of young Melvin Black in March 1979, as well as other incidents of police uh, harassment. FISA brought forth uh, testimony from the African women struggling for reparation in the Oakland Committee on the incidents of uh, police terror. Uh, Sister Akile Akuoko uh, from the National Committee to Free Yusuf Al Haq. Uh, testified uh, uh, about the oppression in Buffalo, New York. Uh, Pianke Ladapul Solanke, chairman of the National United F uh, Movement in Barbados, uh, led off with a thorough recounting of the testimony and how it applied uh, to international law that had uh, been violated, and he concluded that the evidence had been irrefutable. Uh, uh, Rick Ayers of the Committee in Solidarity with African Independence pointed out that North Americans had sat in judgment too long on African people and the evidence of the tribunal was not something for North Americans to pass judgment on. Rather, the tribunal itself has passed judgment on North American society. The U.S. is clearly guilty as charged, and the task of North Americans is to uh, build militant, militant solidarity with that final judgment. Samba Mbu of Senegal agreed with the guilty verdict and expressed enthusiasm for his opportunity to meet with so many African people here. Uh, Serge uh, Mukende of the Cong Congolese National Liberation Front uh, added uh, to the guilty verdict. And then following the summaries of the judges, the people advocate Amali Shetela summed up the proceeding as the most powerful uh, uh, in a serious uh, address. So uh, the summary of the uh, people's advocate was greeting with the most enthusiastic applause as the African people present paid tribute to the tremendous struggle that had uh, been, that had, that struggle that had been taken on uh, to build the tribunal and pledge to make it strong and, and legitimate by taking on the struggle for reparations. Now, ultimately, the tribunal was an overwhelmingly uh, uh, success because it drew together the honest sector, the working class base of our revolutionary movement for national liberation. As has always been the case in the past, the working class of the African population is the class which takes the initiative, which sets the terms for advancing our struggle against the real enemy and oppressor of the U.S. government. Uh, so I'm going to stop now. Uh, and I hope, you know, let's take the time to have uh, some discussion. Uhuru. Uhuru, let's appreciate and salute our leadership, Chairman Mala Shatella, for that brilliant study. So we first want to acknowledge all of our viewers, both on YouTube and on Facebook. This has um, been a very popular uh, discussion, and there are a lot of people tuning in to YouTube and Facebook right now. So we have viewers from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, St. Louis, Missouri, Memphis, Tennessee, London, UK, Rotterdam, Netherlands, Kingston, New York, Orange, New Jersey, um, Nigeria, Portland, Oregon, Clearwater, Florida, Fort Myers, Florida, Huntsville, Alabama, Louisville, Kentucky, France, Occupied Azania, or um, otherwise uh, known as South Africa, Columbus, Ohio, Tel Aviv, Israel, or Occupied Palestine. Um, Penny Hess is viewing on YouTube and commented, salute to Chairman Amalia Shatella, who led the struggle making reparations a household word for 40 years, and who won white people to understand that we all owe reparations to African people. Um, Linda, Sithini on YouTube commented, salute chairman from Occupied Azania. I appreciate the Sunday classes, Uhuru. 
None of y'all on Facebook says, we don't need any more reparation studies and delaying Africa and Africans from receiving reparations, which will send a serious blow to the system. Deputy Chair Onis Dinea Shetela is viewing on Facebook and commented, in order for us to, take, to get power, we must take it. The Congress or court will not give us power. Raya Fogarty um, on YouTube commented, we all white people owe reparations to African people. Absolute unity with the truth and facts stated by Penny Hess. We have Crown Dion on Facebook commented, they may take it as a game, but some things can never be unsaid or undone. Reparations will never be just a subject amongst the party, but worldwide. Ikemba um, in Philly on YouTube commented, Uhuru, yes, we are owed for all that, for all, for all of that beautiful land that was lost when we came to these shores. Um, Africa Forever, um, that's the name, um, their username, um, in Dominica is viewing on YouTube, commented, it's time to pay up. I was thinking Portugal should pay reparations. They first started the slave business. What do you think? All nations were built on our backs. Reparations now. Comrade Bakri Olatunji in Oakland, California, viewing on YouTube, asked, Uhuru Chairman, is there any discussion to resume reparations tribunals? Mm -hmm. Uhuru. Yeah. So, I mean, <clears throat> that, 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 there are such discussions, um, because from our perspective, that's where the, the real question lies, uh, that African people have to have power, that uh, to go back to the oppressor power uh, as your primary method of winning reparations doesn't make sense because they are the basis for needing, for demanding reparations in the first place. And they have never given us anything, anything that we've ever acquired uh, from this oppressive power is what we have taken ourselves. And uh, uh, when they have even uh, conceded to give something, uh, it has been because there's been a powerful movement of African people on the ground that has made that happen. And that the fact is that Africans are going to have to make a revolution uh, to take back our freedom and all of our resources. And, uh, and ultimately, that's what helps. When we, do, when we started with the reparations tribunal, it was putting power in the hands of African people. We uh, were functioning uh, as the state uh, with the only uh, thing being missing uh, as the power to enforce the, what, what has to occur, the rulings of the tribunal. And what we're saying is the people are the enforcers. And the final analysis is that uh, socialism is the acquisition of, is, the, is when the working class becomes the masses and uh, the state becomes the, 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 working, uh, the armed working class. Uh, and that is to say when the people take the power and then you've got socialism. When the workers take the power, then you have uh, socialism. And that's what our, our struggle is about because we know that the entire capitalist uh, system rests upon the edifice of uh, African slavery and colonialism and uh, co the colonialism of the peoples around the world. So yeah, the tribunals are an instrument that we've used uh, to uh, bring people uh, into possession of our own power, uh, as opposed to continuously conceding uh, the oppressor, uh, uh, power to the oppressor. And so uh, that's why we did the tribunal, that's why we've done tribunals subsequent to that, that's why we did tribunals in different uh, states throughout the United States for something like 12 consecutive years. Uhuru. Uhuru. So um, the username Black Wall Street on YouTube is viewing from Oklahoma City and asks, what would be our future after reparations? I think that the, the character of our struggle is going to determine what our future is. And that's why I think this discussion about reparations is so important. Because anything that approximates uh, some reparations that's given to us by the United States or the Congress, even the land that was so forcibly spoken of on a recent uh, Facebook post that I saw from uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan, uh, even that uh, uh, is on a shaky foundation. Because our history has been that the United States government has given stuff before. As I mentioned, it gave uh, something uh, uh, like 400,000 uh, uh, acres of land uh, to African people on January 1st, uh, 1865. By the fall of 1865, <laughs> they had taken it all back. And so uh, uh, they gave uh, what was supposed to be reconstruction. Uh, but uh, when they wanted to, they took all of that back. So we have nothing. And the only way we guarantee that we have something is if we take it and have possession of our, it ourselves. So uh, and, uh, we will, that's why it's so important. That's why we say reparations has to be a, 
uh, one through uh, organization and the power of the people. I mean, our party has done all kinds of stuff. We, for us, reparation is not an aspiration. We're actually in the process of collecting reparations. And you can see that materially in institutions that we've created uh, around the United States. Uh, but, and one, white people, the participation in paying reparations. So it's not an aspiration for us. This is not wishful thinking that I'm talking about. And I think when you look at uh, something like uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is the first uh, military aerial, bomb aerial bombardment that happened in, in, in the world uh, against African people, uh, then our uh, victory will come as a consequence of Africans taking power uh, as a part of a whole revolutionary project. We have to be engaged in that, having our own power. That's why we said black community control the police, not because not, not body cameras or something like that that can seize the power over us to white people. And even, even black community control the police is a, is a reform uh, demand, but not made by reformists. Reformists would simply say body cameras and stuff like that, but we're saying black, African, black community control of the police, the community, the people have to have the power. Everything that we do uh, uh, is based on the assumption. That means we have to organize to take power. If you're really talking about having power, then you have to have revolutionary organization. Join the African People's Socialist Party. Uhura. Uhura. Um, we, comment from Tama Gadini on Facebook says, no more passive resistance, reparations now. Um, we have the question from, a question from Adam Eterno from Rotterdam, Netherlands. It says, um, Af um, Uhuru chairman, um, Africans themselves, Hold on, I'm trying to understand this, sorry. Let me, let me backtrack a little bit so I can make this make sense for you. Um, okay, it says, Uhuru Honorable Chairman Amalia Chatella, Adder from Rotterdam, Netherlands. The question is, Africans, quote, um, quote, Africans themselves sold their own brothers and sisters, women and children to Europeans slash white people, un unquote, is an argument often used against us here in the Netherlands. I usually reply by underlining the lack of merit, the abject fallacy, and moral bankruptcy of this ignominy. Ignominy. Ig ig yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's proven that the would-be slaves were overwhelmingly kidnapped by heavily armed gangs of Europeans. Two wrongs don't make right. Contradiction with assumed and proclaimed moral superior superiority of the opponent. Could the chairman suggest other? Um, better, more powerful, efficient answers to this argument. Yeah, I mean, you've done a real good job yourself, but the response is follow the money. Uh, and you see the consequences of slavery and selling uh, African people uh, in every European territory, including uh, the Netherlands, uh, the tall buildings and all of that. And you see uh, what has happened in Africa uh, as a consequence of this uh, slave trade. It's an attack on Africa that's responsible for all of that. And this is not to absolve every, every African individual uh, uh, who uh, participated with the slave trade. I could go into a long discussion about how uh, that could have happened, would have happened, but I can tell you this, that no African left uh, the continent of Africa and went to Manchester or to Amsterdam and said, hey, I got an idea. Uh, I want you to invest in an idea that I have to go and get Af capture African slaves. It didn't happen that way. Europeans, white people, <coughs> <coughs> left their hostile environment in Europe uh, and then in what we now know as America and went to Africa and kidnapped African people. One, two. Even if what you, uh, if we give you the sat give someone the satisfaction of entertaining that uh, that discussion, and how does that explain? what uh, white people did in Australia. Did the Africans in Australia, black people in Australia also participate in selling black people? Is that how we explain that? How do you explain what happened to the indigenous people? Did uh, somebody send up, some of the indigenous people uh, send somebody over to Europe and say, hey, come over and kill, I'll join with you and kill the rest of us? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a spurious argument and you want to isolate uh, the actions of Europe that built this whole capitalist system uh, to some notion that 16 people in Africa might have participated in selling black people. I mean, this is ridiculous. I heard it said that, uh, that the so-called Indians in the United States sold Manhattan, what they call Manhattan. First of all, there was no Manhattan at the time, but they sold what they call Manhattan uh, for uh, uh, some beads and trinkets. 
And when you know, the obvious lie there is that the indigenous people, uh, nobody owned the land uh, among the indigenous people. You, can, you didn't own land, so it's impossible for any in individuals to have sold the land uh, to the white man for some trinkets. It's just nonsense. And these are stories that have been created by the people who have taken and who cannot uh, actually do a self-criticism. And what those people who are saying that should do is do a self-criticism and join and get in a part of a long queue, a long line of white people and their countries to pay reparations to African people. Uh -huh. yeah. um, Chairman, I, do you want to extend this a little bit longer or? Uh, no, there, is there seem to be, uh, um, yeah, there, there are other questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, Prince Sama, that's the username on uh, YouTube, asked Chairman Amali, the Berlin conferences of 1884 to 1885 made slavery systematic and worldwide. Do these G7 nations need to have another conference on worldwide reparations for Africans to take their apologies <laughs> seriously? No, we need to have another conference of the African Socialist International to overthrow these G7 and others who uh, participate in exploiting and stealing the value of African labor and land even up to this point. I mean. Uh, Berlin was important. What they did in Berlin 1864, uh, 1894 and 95 was important. That's uh, for the uh, benefit of somebody, few people who may not know of the Berlin Conference. It's when Europeans got together in Berlin, Germany, and they actually carved up uh, this, carved up the continent of Africa into these untenable entities that they now call countries and, and insanely refer to as nations. Uh, and, uh, uh, and they did this to share these different territories out to different European uh, powers. And they did this uh, uh, as a means of avoiding fights among themselves over who was going to get what parts of Africa. And that was in 1894 uh, uh, and 95. This conference happened in Berlin, Germany. And uh, so uh, as I think that the reparations should, as a part of our movement, we should demand reparations everywhere. I think on the continent of Africa, we've got situations with neocolonial puppet regimes. Uh, you can see them all the time, hat in hand, going begging uh, uh, some European power, please uh, give, forgive our debt, uh, loan us some money, or put us in greater debt, or something to that effect, selling off all of our goods and our resources. It needs to be popular uh, 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 ground swelling movements on the ground in, on the continent of Africa. Uh, demanding reparations and demanding that these neocolonial puppets demand reparations from the European powers that stole it from us. And this can be the basis of really mobilizing African people, workers on the ground, who are tired of starvation and poverty and who are tired of lick spittle Negro leaders who are simply going uh, again with their begging bowls to white power and demand that instead they go with a stick or a knife, or a gun, or something else, and require, or organize the mass of the people on the ground to take back what belongs to us. And because the, the, the future of Europe is in Africa, and the, the future of white power is in Africa, and everything they're stealing from Africa and from African people. And if you see what's happening in the European world today, the crisis they have, an economic crisis and things like that, it is because Africans and other peoples around the world are, make, are making it difficult for them to continue to bleed us. If not Africans doing this, then contests between the white powers and others themselves about who's going to get what is making it difficult for them to do things in the same old way. The future of Europe is in Africa, is in our hands, and as C.L.R. James once said, we must put it in our heads. Uhuru. Um, well, Chairman, ready to, call? okay, all right, so um, really, again, want to appreciate you for this amazing study, and, you know, just really, one, saying that this whole question of reparations being talked about on the international level did not just happen randomly, um, but it's uh, been a process of, you know, the African People's Socialist Party, you know, waging the struggle to make reparations a household word. May I just say this finally? Yes. We're going to keep talking about this discussion. Next week, we'll talk more about reparations. We're going to work more with the book, Reparations Now. Because part of what we want to do is show you that uh, we didn't just have some kind of mock hearing, some kind of mock court uh, in, in the, with the World Tribunal in New York. It was a real court. The mock courts are the one that we go to under white power. 
And we even use established international law as the basis for conducting these things. And we want to show you what that was and show you why it's viable, why it's real. And we're going to show you why it's so important, the method, the, the strategy that we use uh, around the reparation, re reparations question of taking it to the people as opposed to relying on the very same system that oppresses us. Because reparations, first of all, cannot happen uh, without power on, the, on our hands. And, and the only place it appears to have happened without power is with uh, the so-called uh, Jews uh, uh, after the, uh, the, 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 the so-called Holocaust. And the reason it happened there is not because white people, other white people suddenly began to love Jews because it's the white people who killed the Jews, not, not Arabs, not Muslims, not uh, Africans, etc. The reason it happened there is because the imperialism needed to have a cover to put in all that money into the hands of those white people who were located in, pa in Palestine uh, to fund them. They funded the, the, the assault on the Palestinian people, the Arab people, to take that land and to hold that land in custody where, and to act as the police in that region to protect the uh, petroleum and other kind of interest that the U.S. and other imperialist powers have there. That's the only reason reparations went there and continues to go there today. So if, if you're really talking about reparations, you've got to have power, real reparations. We're going to have to take it. And then uh, even if they, if, you got, if they gave us a payment tomorrow and we have no power, they'll have it two days later. They'll have it back. Yep. We have to have power. And you can't, they're not going to give us power. It's lucrative. Controlling black people is a lucrative business. And so we're going to have to fight to get it, and there's no other way. Uhuru. Uhuru. Yeah. Well, just thank you for that, Chairman. So because of time, we want everyone to know that if your question was not answered, one of our moderators will correspond with you and make sure that the chairman sees your question. This study was brought to you by the Department of Agitation and Propaganda, winning the war of ideas. For your worldwide revolutionary news and analysis, visit theburningspear.com. For revolutionary radio, dynamic shows, and music by Africans all around the world, tune in to Black Power 96.3 FM, broadcasting out of St. Petersburg, Florida, and accessible via the Black Power 96 app for Apple and Android, or online at blackpower96.org. Did you unite with what you heard today and want to learn more about how you can get involved with the African People's Socialist Party? Visit apspohuru.org for all information regarding how you can apply. Start preparing to attend the 10th annual conference of the Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations on August 10th and 11th, themed Turn Imperialist Wars into Wars Against Imperialism, happening in St. Louis at the Uhuru House on West Florissant. For more info, for more info visit blackisbackcoalition.org. Registration will be open soon. Order your copy of Chairman Amali Eshetela's latest book, Vanguard, The Advanced Attachment of the African Revolution, The Political Report to the Seventh Congress at burningspearmarketplace.com. Were you moved by Chairman's presentation this morning? You can bring this electrifying presentation to your school campus, bookstore, concert hall, and more. To book Chairman Amali Eshetela for the Vanguard 2019 International Speaking Tour, contact Uhuru Tours at info at or call 727 914 3621. Sign up for the Marcus Garvey Legacy Cruise. The Marcus Garvey Legacy Cruise is the annual fundraiser held to support the work of the African Socialist International. The African Socialist International is an organization made up of African people located virtually on every continent, dedicated to overturning the conditions faced by African people worldwide. So due to imperialism in crisis, um, we all know that the U.S. has initiated the travel ban on Cuba, which was one of our original destinations, but we are still traveling. So again, um, if you have already started the process of booking your cruise or you know, want to cruise with us, you, call, you can still call the travel agent, Linda Stern, to find out the alternative destinations, and she can be reached at 732-972-4171. And if you want to further support the ASI and the Marcus Garvey Legacy Cruise, make a donation by visiting visiting AhuruLegacyCruise.org. Thank you all for tuning in, and make sure you like and subscribe to the Burning Spear TV on YouTube to catch every episode of Amali Taught Me Sunday Study. Uhuru. Mm -hmm.